Ben, Moses, Sam, Arthur, unknown men, Neil, Crawford, Gabe, Lydia, Sabra, Mary, Binky, Julia, Serena, Archie, unknown, unknown, and unknown. From the construction of the very first buildings at the University of Alabama to its destruction on April 4th, 1865, African Americans labored at this institution. As enslaved people, they made the materials that were put into our campus buildings. They cleared the land. They implemented the original architectural design as construction workers. Their craftsmanship was in the, on full display in the antebellum buildings. They too predated the hiring of faculty, the enrollment of first students, and the opening on our campus in October and early 1831. But yet, their names haunt me. Those uncommon bonds with the early faculty members who made decisions based on their lives haunt me. But you see, I'm not the first scholar or faculty member at UA to talk about this history. Scholars like Al Brophy, James Sellers, A. James Fuller, all told about this history, but they focused on the white campus stakeholders. And they focused on and showed how slavery and its foundation role, foundation role built UA. From the students, the powerful alumni, how the institution shapes local economies, developed a pro-slavery thought because UA is built in the Black Belt of Alabama, a region deriving from the soil and the people who labored on that ground. And UA advanced its pro-slavery thought and justified its existence accordingly. So for me, when I came here, it wasn't productive to ask the questions about the white stakeholders and our gaze that had been centered on the trustees, the administrators, faculty, alumni, and others. Instead, it was more productive to ask, who were the enslaved men, women, and children who labored at UA? What were their experiences and contributions as institutional builders rather than just laborers? And more importantly, what were their contributions as survivors of slavery in their legacy on the campus and in the wider Tuscaloosa community? And here, this, I committed myself to doing this work. But this work made me reckon with something that I hadn't reckoned with before and an uncommon bond I had between scholarship and the lived experience. Because when one researches the history of slavery of their employer, a place where I walk the same grounds as enslaved people who cut our quad land, built the buildings, built some that still survive. The history of the Jim Crow white supremacist archival project becomes real. It's no longer something I read about in my um, scholarship and books or something I teach my undergrads and grad students. It becomes my everyday life. And I have to see these uncommon bonds become very visible as I walk because I can't ignore those names. And in this process, I had to be brave, intentional, and willing to get outside of my comfort zone. Because these uncommon bonds still shapes all of our experiences. And if we are all you way, this is the legacy we have to deal with. Neil, 
Crawford, and Gabe. When I arrived at the University of Alabama for my campus interview, this little building next to the Gorgas Library piqued my intellectual curiosity. It was built during the Civil War and it housed the University Drum Corps. It has a historical marker, but that marker revealed more so, it silences more so than revealing the truth. And I asked who were the names of these enslaved people? But that intellectual curiosity turned to action when an African-American male student questioned the relevance of studying slavery and its legacy on institutional higher ed during my second semester at the University of Alabama. But Dr. Green, slavery did not exist on our campus. That comment in the form of a question reveal to me the myths that institutions like UA likes to tell itself and its stakeholders, and how we can be lulled into complicity by markers. And this is where that comment got me out in asking those questions. And for Neil Crawford and Gabe, as I worked through the university archives, their names came to the fore and quite quickly in President Garland's papers, the third president of the university. Because Neil and Gabe were owned by Judge Watson and Mrs. Watson of Montgomery. A surviving past revealed that they had family in Montgomery and Mobile, and they could visit them when the cadets were on vacation. Crawford replaces Neil, and it's Gabe and Neil, and Crawford, sorry, who are standing on April 3rd, issuing out the long, slow drum roll. They performed their duty. So how did these names and these men of three drummers get erased? And how did the, the university remembered or forgot three individuals? Drawing on the university yearbooks, I quickly found how the real history of slavery and the slave past was used as a myth. A myth by the Jim Crow campus to justify no black students here. And I, it can also be weaponized when necessary. And in 1961, on the yearbook of the Corolla, there is the guardhouse on the cover. And that guardhouse is a symbol used throughout the yearbook where it is there in white and the campus community superimposed over it. And in the student life section, there's a male Bama cheerleader jumping and cheering on this lost cause campus as it is a symbol now for massive resistance. Because in 1961, Five years after authoring Lucy attempts to desegregate the University of Alabama. But a mob succeeds in getting her expelled. This is the symbol of white resistance and success. Two years later, though, we have George Wallace making his failed stand at the schoolhouse door and the admission of Vivian Malone and James Hood. But yet three drummers, Neil, Crawford, and Gabe, still were lost. After a year and a half of me doing these tours, though, on campus, this site is a no tailgate zone, elevated to the same level as the mound and in other antebellum structures on our campus. Binky, Julia, Serena, and Archie. Enslaved children were also important to UA's story because behind the president's mansion, there are mothers owned by President Manley and later um, President Garland brings his enslaved women to campus too. These children born in those slave cabins, their geography was limited as their mothers were behind the president's mansion or within. But these enslaved children 
Previous scholars have not fully appreciated their story. And from birth to childhood, they played. They listened to their mother and got advice. And upon reaching adolescence, when profit margins proved more necessary than their continued presence on campus, they are hired out to the local community. But I wonder what the sounds of these children made for an antebellum campus. And as I do this work, I even include the youngest people who experienced a campus and then later survived into adulthood. And as adults, they built institutions and communities of freedom. Churches, the early Republican Party, and schools. Taking this research, I built the Hallow Grounds Project. The Hallow Grounds Project is a multifaceted, ongoing research project designed to take this history of campus history of slavery and connect it with wider publics wanting to know this information about the lives, the experiences, and the names of the enslaved people who labored here and their descendants who survived this campus history. And for me, this project started with a walking tour and it has expanded to two online versions, a digital presence with some of the documents widely accessible, and then also to my classes now teach this history. And I do this because those names haunt me. And it reminds me of James Baldwin's words, the past, history is never the past, it is the present. We carry our history. Jeremiah Barnes. We do this work, and I do this work on this campus, I'm mindful of those who survived slavery. And where is the place of these individuals who built the Tuscaloosa community? They were enslaved at UA, oftentimes stole their education from UA, and then did good in the community. What is their place in UA's present and their future? And how can we use these descendants and the entire black Tuscaloosa community as the starting point for truth, reconciliation, and repair. And to build UA into an inclusive, equitable, diverse future campus. So in effect, we have to make a place for Jeremiah Barnes. Barnes, in the records under slavery, is known as Jer. He was enslaved by Judge Washington Moody. He worked occasionally on UA's campus while still in education. That's why he stops working at UA. He gets caught reading. After the Civil War, he becomes involved in local politics, but he's known for education because this self-taught man became one of the first public school teachers in the city of Tuscaloosa. He will then become principal and superintendent and taught for several decades. Barred from sending his children to UA, he sends all five of his kids to Tuskegee University. And at Tuskegee, he developed a relationship with Booker T. Washington and personally inviting Washington to Tuscaloosa. Washington gives his first and only address at First African Baptist which was founded by other former enslaved campus laborers. And in this address, Jeremiah Barnes goes from self-taught former enslaved person to hosting President Abercrombie and the mayor of Tuscaloosa. He is the MC for this event. So how do we take a Jeremiah Barnes and others who survive and use them and center their survival 
in their diversity, but also how they did not use slavery as their end point and not to move forward, but use it to build a better, just town and institution. So where are they in our future, in our present? Do we give them legacy status as we give white students who can claim antebellum roots? Do we add new buildings to them? Do we do what Georgetown do, did, or do we do something that's UA? Those questions are unknown. But as UA, we have to grapple with this history and its legacy. And that means we have to recognize those survivors of campus slavery. And they include Peter Archie, I'm oh, sorry, Peter Manley, Archie Manley, both born at UA and survive into adulthood. Cornelius Garland, Claiborne Garland, former enslaved people who become paid employees and then build schools for African-American children with their wages. Jeremiah Barnes, but more importantly, Candace Barnes, the known living descendant of Jeremiah Barnes. Let them be our future. And let these Barnes that continue to unite us build our future. Thank you. <laughs>